We'd like to get started. My name is Christine Fulch. I'm an assistant professor of cultural anthropology here at Duke University. I have a secondary appointment in environmental sciences and policy. And I want to welcome you to our second day of the Amazon Humanities Lab Plant Symposium. We are under the umbrella of the Franklin Humanities Institute, which is an incubating space for cross-disciplinary conversations. And we want to start off by thanking Eli Meyerhoff for his incredible work in organizing, not just today, not just yesterday, but all of our lives. And so he has, he has been tireless. He has a whole stash of caffeine in the corner, <laughs> which helps explain, I think, some of his tirelessness. Um, but we want to thank him um, and acknowledge all the work that he has done. I want to also thank uh, the... FHI for opening up this space uh, for conversations about the Amazon. If you're interested to hear more, and, and Amazon doesn't mean the people who deliver the things that we order online. We are talking about the river, the forest, the air, the water, the imaginaries around a particular space in South America and beyond. Um, so, uh, so we thank the um, we thank MHI for opening up this space for us to have these conversations, and we really wish we could be in person. But if you're interested in joining more more of our events, you can find us online. Um, and if you are interested in seeing what we've done in the past, there's also links there. And I want to welcome um, and give thanks as well to the co-directors of this lab, uh, Paul Baker, who is over there on the screen. Hi, Paul. Uh, and Gustavo Trabello, who works in romance studies on film and so much more. And uh, Gustavo has a pretty active um, agenda in terms of, of a film series through this lab. So if you're interested in these uh, kinds of other, uh, other questions, other issues, I would, you know, please, please sign up. The other thing I want to note about the lab is that we're, we're going to do a, a symposium on memory and museums in April. Um, so look for that. Um, so I want to um, I want to start by giving a little introduction to our event today. Then we're going to listen to the participants in the roundtable, and then we'll open up a conversation. So I'm going to read. <laughs> um, so I'm a cultural anthropologist. So I start by thinking about this from some of the ways that cultural anthropologists think about knowledge in anthropology. We might say that plants are good to think with. That is, thinking about them helps us see how we understand and fit into the world. But what if plants are more than just living instruments or living tools? What if plants are persons? What if plants are teachers and not merely adornments? What if plants are guides? On the round table on plants of the Amazon opens a space for dialogue on key turns in theoretical approaches to the study of and with plants. Research methodology innovations, ethical interventions, connections and continuities of plant practices beyond the Amazonian region. Plants, which may simultaneously be so unlike animate animal life so other as to seem wholly alien, and yet so mundane that they can seem like an inert, almost inanimate backdrop to action. Um, plants force us to query the very categories we have for life, agency, and intelligence. By making us rethink personhood, plants generate new ontologies. In recent years, scholars from all sorts of ranges of study, botany, neuroscience, agronomy, art history, anthropology, theology, have begun to reconsider how plants communicate, act, and even think. Key thinkers in this so-called botanical turn in cultural anthropology have been indigenous plant practitioners, shamans, and scholars, in the Americas for whom plants are partners and mentors. Um, Darwin famously noted that the radical, the root tip of plants act like a primitive 
that word, his word, animal brain, touching, sensing, making decisions about where to turn. Scientists have learned that plants release chemicals when injured or eaten so that other plants nearby know that one of their species is under duress. And if plant neuroscientists are right and intelligence is the ability to solve problems, plants are amazingly good at solving problems. And then one thing for us to ask is what does this mean for our definition of intelligence? So plants solve problems. The strategies they use to do so, to reproduce, to avoid predators, to find water, may be thought of as vegetal or plant thinking. Similarly, the plants solve human problems as people look to plants to solve what we think are ostensibly human issues. And so centering plants in political economy, which is what I like to work on, um, shows how the networkness of the political, economic, social, and cultural processes over time and space. The movement of plants accompanied the movement of people in the colonization of the Americas, for example, and the creation of empires. So new food crops fed armies, medicinal plants like Sinjona combating malaria and allowed, it, allowed European troops to venture farther into Africa and Asia. Commodities justified imperial political economic structures. So my own interest in the, can you share the, I have like three pictures. My own interest in plants of the Amazon, this is totally what happens like to my screen when I try to share it. <laughs> um, my own interest in plants of the Amazon comes through a book project I'm working on about yerba mate, uh, the beverage that's uh, really popular in the Southern Cone. So images of Argentina, Paraguay, Uruguay, and Southern Brazil often feature people drinking this. It's a stimulating holly um, in the southern part of South America. But in my work on a book of cultural, the cultural history of Yerba Mate, I learned that the Americas has an ilex fix. There's a community of plant practices around ilex for stimulating beverages that stretches from North America through the Amazon into the heart of the River Plate Basin. Um, and so uh, what I was going to show you was some images of the other hollies that people in the Americas drink for uh, their daily uplift. Um, and ironically, Yopan, which is the stimulant that's growing a yard shrubbery all over Duke's campus, um, is ironically the least known. But I'm drinking it right now, and it's highly recommended. So our speakers today continue a conversation sparked yesterday on our first day of this plant symposium. Last night, Brazilian botanist Lucia Lohmann gave a lecture entitled The Amazon Rainforest, An Evolutionary Tale. It was excellent. Uh, Dr. Lohmann's wide-ranging talk explored the deep history of the Amazon through the evolution of plants, animals, the changing climate, I think that's called paleoclimate, geomorphology, how the land itself changed, um, and plate tectonics. Uh, and during the conversation, a participant asked an important question about how to engage with indigenous communities as part of the knowledge making process. That question is in many ways the invitation for today's roundtable. And so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to give a brief introduction of our presenters. Um, and you can totally like cyberstalk them or Google them to find out more. Uh, just to give you a sense of some of the things that they're working on. So Mireya Campanera Rey is a postdoctoral researcher in the Department of Anthropology, Philosophy, and Social Work at the University Rovira y Virgil in Tarragona, Spain. Um, Dr. Campanera Rey holds the PhD in Cultural Anthropology, American and African History from the Universitat de Barcelona. Uh, Dr. Campanera Rey's published research on the Peruvian Amazon has engaged a broad range of topics from the legal construction of campesino, peasant versus native, to the cosmology cosmovision of the Pucama Pucamidia indigenous group, to questions of territoriality and ancestral knowledge. She also has a whole research focus on food itineraries and food insecurity in Europe. Um, amidst her many publications, I want to highlight her co authored book, Árboles Medicinales, Conocimientos y Usos de la Cuenca Baja del Rio. Marañon, so medicinal trees, knowledges, and uses in the lower river Marañon Basin. Next, Ruben, Ruth Goldstein, sorry. Ruth Goldstein is assistant professor of gender and women's studies uh, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. 
She holds a PhD in medical anthropology from the University of California, Berkeley, and University of California, San Francisco. I didn't even know they were allowed to do that. Uh, Goldstein works on the circulation of toxicities and its connections with extractivism and extraction in Latin America. Uh, she has an extensive publication record, which I won't detail, except to highlight two points. She's currently drafting a book manuscript entitled Life in Traffic, Women, Plants, and Gold Along the, the Interoceanic Highway. Uh, and a 2019 uh, article, Ethnobotanies of Refusal, Methodologies in Respecting Planted Human Resistance uh, in Anthropology Today. Next. Uh, Chris Jarrett is a cultural anthropologist and environmental social scientist in the Andes Amazon program in the Keller Science Action Center at the Field Museum in Chicago. Uh, Dr. Jarrett holds a PhD in anthropology from the University of Texas at San Antonio. Jarrett has, has conducted extensive field work among the Quechua in Ecuador and has written several fascinating articles on how alterity is configured via notions of shamanism, uh, indigenous cosmologies and interactions with forest landscapes. I am personally thrilled that Dr. Jarrett joins us today because of his work on Alex Wayusa and the Wayu ceremony, uh, which touches the sort of the work I'm interested in with Yerba Mate. You can read more about that in a 2016 economic botany article entitled Amazonian Wayusa, uh, a historical and ethnobotanical overview. And last but not least, uh, Robin Rod is Associate Professor of Anthropology at Duke Kunshan University. He holds a PhD from the University of Western Australia. Um, Dr. Rod researches psychedelics, consciousness, citizenship, from the Amazon to the Southern Congo to even Australia. At Duke, Dr. Rod co-directs the New Citizenship Lab at Duke Kunshan University Humanities Research Center, which explains the dynamics that drive expansions of and restrictions on the performance of citizenship, as well as along with the novel conceptions of rights, responsibility, and political community. And just to announce an upcoming live event that they're um, hosting, uh, John Keane, professor of politics at the University of, S of Sydney and the WCB, which is, I guess, in Berlin, um, is going to be giving a talk entitled The Shortest History of uh, Democracy on April 7th. Um, although it's April 8th in the morning in China. And so, so Dr. Rob is not gonna be speaking here live at 3.15 in the morning. Um, so he has sent, he's graciously sent us uh, his presentation in advance. Um, and so that's just to give you a sense of, of what, of who we're gonna listen to this afternoon. Our, our vision for this conversation is not to have a polished keynote, but instead to share ways that we're thinking about these themes and these questions to then be able to dialogue about potential turns in our own research, questions that we would like answered, etc. So it's a more, um, a more informal conversation. I'm totally looking forward to it. So uh, without further ado, if we could cede the floor to Dr. Jared. All right. Hi, everyone. Let's see if I can share my screen here. Can everyone see the screen? Yes. Excellent. First off, thanks so much, Christine, and everyone else for being here today. It's it's exciting to be able to engage in this dialogue. And uh, right back at you, excited to hear more about some of the, the Mate Wayusa connections. Um, so what I will be sharing with you today is a brief introduction, very brief to some of the work that I've been do doing on a native Amazonian plant called Wayusa. And in general, the approach that I've taken this work is rooted in what's really a longstanding strategy known as the social life of things, uh, which analyzes the different meanings that become ascribed to an object as it circulates through social systems and regimes of value. One particular emphasis within this strategy has been to focus on commodities as a way of showing how capitalism manifests in particular cultural contexts along the nodes and commodity chains, and how capitalist and non-capitalist systems intersect or are imbricated at these different nodes. And the history of this kind of approach really goes very deep back to Malinowski and some of the very earliest cultural or social anthropology um, with his study of the Kula Ring and Oceania. 
And versions of it have developed through classic works on sugar by Sidney Mintz um, and more recent work on broccoli, coffee, and oil, um, among many others. And my research, which I conducted um, really in two main periods of fieldwork, one in 2011, 2012, and another one between 2016 and 2018, um, between Quito and Napo province of Ecuador, applied this approach to Wayusa and use it to address a variety of issues of contemporary concern in Amazonia, um, such as native plant commercialization as a market-oriented conservation strategy, commodity certification and consumer activism, intellectual property and traditional knowledge, among many others. So Wayusa is, um, as Christine mentioned, also in the uh, Elex Ilex genus together with Mate. It grows to an average height of 10 meters and reproduces asexually um, through human planting of stem cuttings. It has high levels of caffeine, theobromine, L-theanine, uh, which make it a powerful but simultaneously relaxing and nourishing stimulant. And the earliest archaeological evidence that we have of Wayusa is from northwestern Bolivia um, in a, a dried leaf bundle that was found alongside other instruments that were associated with shamanic activities and dated to around 500 CE. In terms of its current range, um, Wayusa is primarily found in Ecuador, but can also be found in parts of um, southwestern Colombia and throughout parts of Peru. Um, but it's, it's really strongest in Ecuador. And I like this map because it, it provides some comparison of the ranges for Wayusa and, and Mate. It's a bit of an old map. Um, but you can get some sense of some of those com comparisons and range. And so Wayusa is a plant that's consumed by a variety of different Amazonian peoples, in, including the Shuar, Achuar, um, but most importantly, arguably among the Quechua, which is who, who I worked with. And for Quechua people, Wayusa is really central to their identity and to their culture. And first and foremost, it's seen as a strong stimulant that's used to combat laziness and stay awake during long hunting expeditions. It's also seen as having a variety of different healing properties um, and is used both by itself and in uh, combination with other medicinal plants for a variety of different ailments. It has a close connection with sexuality and is seen to increase sexual performance and reproductive capacity. Um, it also is understood to protect people who consume it from common dangers of forest life, such as snake and insect bites. And finally, it has a strong association with the dream world, both as a plant that can cause people to have dreams and as a plant that's consumed as part of processes of interpretation of dreams. So Wayusa is typically drunk in the early morning hours um, as a part of a, a time that's referred to locally as Waisupina or Wayusa drinking time. And this is a highly convivial space for families, a time that they use to interpret dreams from the night before, tell stories, pass on knowledge, uh, plan and prepare for work in the gardens and the forest, play music among many other activities. And one of the <clears throat> activities that we did as part of that 2011, 2012 project that I worked on, which was focused on um, Wayusa's role in Quechua culture more, more broadly, were these um, natural dye art contest at bilingual schools. And this was one that was done depicting the scene of Waisupina um, by a bilingual school teacher in the community of Awayaku. So Wayusa is also a time that's very important for advice giving 
Um, it's a time where elders give advice to young people, as my host grandfather does in this video, which I hope you can hear, but uh, can at least see. So it's a longer video, it's all in Quechua, so I'll, I'll just leave it there. But um, this is the, the kind of scene and setting um, where Wayusa is consumed. It's, it's a very intimate environment. Um, and another common practice that occurs during Wayusa time um, that has its, its whole structure to it, but the idea is um, that they apply capsicum pepper juice to children, typically to children's eyes, sometimes to adults, as a way of making them stronger and preparing them to face uh, the animals of the forest and the moral challenges of life. Um, it's sometimes also applied to politicians who are found to be corrupt, which is interesting. Um, and so Wayusa had, there have been ideas about commercializing Wayusa for a really long time. The Jesuits actually briefly sold Wayusa in Quito as a, a purported cure for venereal diseases. And um, several explorers had uh, thought of the idea of commercializing Wayusa as a tea that could compete with, with, England, with tea in England and other places. But the large scale, commercialization of Wayusa didn't really start until 2008 when this organization called Fundacion Runa was created. Um, it was founded by a few students from Brown University in partnership with um, some Quechua people. And it initially started as a nonprofit but became later a hybrid nonprofit, for-profit social enterprise. Um, and the idea was to transform this locally consumed product into what came to be the tagline of clean energy um, and sold first as box teas and then later as, as bottled iced teas and energy drinks. And the clean part here refers to uh, a differentiation with conventional energy drinks that have a lot of uh, synthetic chemicals. So the supply chain basically uh, looks like this. The Runa purchases Wayusa from Quechua small-scale producers, processes it, processes the leaves in their factory, and then transforms them into these different products, or sometimes uh, just produces the extract that's then sold to other companies to mix in different kinds of beverage products. Um, and Runa really developed this supply chain, this commodity chain from scratch. Um, as the first major company to export it on a large commercial scale. And they built the industry in alignment with a set of principles and practices outlined in fair trade and organic certification standards. Um, and then this is kind of a long story, but in 2018, uh, a company called All Market Inc., which was the parent company of coconut water maker Vita Coco. Uh, purchased Runa, and then just last year in around October, um, that company was put up uh, for an initial public offering. So it's, it's now a public company that owns Runa as one of its brands. And along the way, lots of other companies have uh, emerged both within Ecuador and globally to commercialize Wayusa. And what my research really did was try to trace this process of commodification of Wayusa, examining its impacts on Quechua livelihoods, landscapes, culture, and politics. And one of the examples um, of how this process has played out is through the reification of this idea of Wayusa Upina as ceremony and a variety of different forms of cultural tourism, that have developed. You can see on the left here, this is um, that actor Channing Tatum who invested in Runa and became a big um, kind of spokesperson for Runa for a while. Um, 
And I also used the case of Wayusa to analyze the ethics of commodification itself and the intersections between the commodification of the plant and commodification of the knowledge and practices surrounding it. Um, and where this came up most significantly was in terms of a scientific boom around Wayusa, where there were all these papers coming out about chemical and ecological and other dimensions of Wayusa and in the area of marketing and cultural ethnic marketing uh, of Wayusa. And as part of this process, I registered lots of feelings of dispossession of both the economic and cultural value of Wayusa and fears of Wayusa being patented, which is sort of a common uh, fear across the Amazon due to experiences with ayahuasca and, and other products. Um, and you can see here a quote from a 2016 meeting where, where this sentiment was expressed. Some of the regional indigenous federations have also made um, similar declarations, efforts to assert indigenous people's claims to Wayusa um, in response to, to a perception of, of dispossession. And um, lastly, I just wanted to say, you know, what I what I have found is that Quechua people have seen Wayusa commercialization um, in many ways as an appealing livelihood opportunity as part of this broader bioeconomy, biocommerce uh, approach that's being so heavily promoted. And Wayusa sales have been an important source of income for the nearly 3,000 Quechua families who have grown it commercially. Uh, many people have worked for these different companies and the fair trade certification process meant that uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars went to Wayusa producer associations like the one you see in this bottom photo uh, to support their different priorities. Um, and some Kicho people have started their own factories or developed uh, different pieces of the commodity chain that they control themselves. Um, and interestingly, it's also become, Wayusa has become some of something cool for young people in a way that it, it had a previous association as, you know, what old people did, they wake up super early and, you know, play their drums or talk about old people things. Um, and so there's been a, a transformation locally in the way that it's conceptualized. Um, but in the midst of some of these potentially positive uh, developments with the industry, I think it's important to pay attention to these different forms of exclusions and perceptions or realities of exploitation and, and dispossession, both material and symbolic, um, that build on historical experiences throughout Amazonian history. Um, so these are a couple of the products that have come from this research. This was a trilingual book that uh, we did as part of that 2011-2012 project. And then um, my dissertation and a couple publications from a few years ago, I'm working on uh, more work today. So happy to be able to share a little bit about this. I'm uh, eager also to answer any questions or uh, elaborate on anything that seems interesting to you. Thanks again. Um, thank you so much, Chris. Uh, so I think now we'd like to have uh, Robin's presentation. Thank you. Hello, my name is Robin Rod. I'm, I'm at Duke Kunshan University currently in Shanghai. Thanks, Christine and Eli, for organizing this event and for inviting me to participate. I'm sorry I can't be there um, to join the discussion. Today, I want to present four propositions on the rise of psychedelic medicine and the displacement of indigenous Amazonian knowledge, which come out of my reflections of working as an anthropologist uh, for many years on questions of shamanism and the indigenous use of psychedelic plants in the Amazon. On the left of the screen is a, is a plant uh, I think is a Malawetia species. I'm an anthropologist, not a botanist. I don't really know, although I have tried it, to have it identified, which is considered by the Piro ethnic group of Southern Venezuela to, to be a drug that uh, founded thought that in the beginning 
the, the original creator gods um, were born out of pulp of this hallucinogenic plant. And it's this plant which enabled them to have the, the creative powers of thought and of consciousness. So drugs precede thought. And in this sense, uh, Pieroa uh, cosmology is not so different to Western scientific cosmological notions, uh, which insist on reducing consciousness and cognition to a chemically driven brain. But after this, things diverge quite quickly. So it's out of this divergence and convergence of thinking about psychedelics, uh, consciousness, indigenous and scientific perspectives that I want to make some, um, some, some raise some discussion points. There's a long tradition in anthropology um, of anthropologists and ethnobotanists, and here's Richard Evan Schulte's pictured in the left, um, working in the Amazon with indigenous peoples, doing long-term field work, attempting to document and understand the ways that indigenous people uh, use plants, understand plants in which ideas about plants are embedded in social organization, political structures, mythological uh, uh, knowledge, ritual practice, notions of healing the body and harm that are fundamental to life. And psychedelics have played a significant role in this, especially in, in, in Amazonian indigenous notions of power, <clears throat> creation, destruction, healing, um, threaded through the entire um, epistemological order. This is what inspired me to become an anthropologist uh, and work uh, around uh, questions of power and knowing relating to Yopo, derived from Anadinothera peregrina, one of the plants of the gods. This long tradition, I think, of anthropological thinking about the importance of psychedelic, psychedelic plants in Amazonian society uh, uh, has led to, uh, you know, uh, uh, comes out of a, even a longer anthropological tradition of thinking about intercultural dialogue and exchange as the possibility for imagining new ways of being, which are not simply copies of other forms of being, but come out of a creative engagement of different forms of thinking and doing in the world. This is the substance of this quote here I take from Gerardo Rachel Donatov, who spent many decades working with Tucano peoples and trying to understand specifically um, the significance of psychedelic and visionary uh, uh, experience to Tucano symbolism, mythology, uh, and social organization. He says, I noted among them particular mental structures and value systems that seem to be beyond any of the typologies and categories held then by anthropology. What I did was find a world with a philosophy so coherent, moral so high, social and political organizations of great complexity, and with sound environmental management based on well-founded knowledge. In effect, I saw that the indigenous cultures offered unsuspected options that offered strategies of cultural development that simply we should not ignore because they contain valid solutions and are applicable to a variety of human problems. This is the recognition of the, 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 the holistic integration of plants visionary experiences in a, in a total life form and the potential um, um, value of taking these forms of thought and social organization seriously. Now to extend this, um, I, I want to go now to, to, to Viveros and Castro drawing on the work of Pierre Clast, who proposed then um, that uh, one unique thing he thought about Amazonian political organization was it's that was that it was fundamentally organized against the formation of a state, and in this sense, uh, that, that there was this radical uh, political possibility embedded in Amazonian philosophy, and that this is something deserving of great attention. <clears throat> Referring to class. Viveros de Castro writes, primitive society, and this is the term class used that we would now refer to as, as indigenous Amazonian society, is one of the conceptual embodiments of the thesis that another world is possible, that there is life beyond capitalism, as there is society outside of the state. There always was, and for this we struggle, there always will be. 
Only on the condition of being unhinged from Western conceptual frames could the radical originality of Amazonian people's contribution to humanity's intellectual heritage, including that relating to food plants, be fully grasped. If we simply re, uh, remove um, elements of indigenous cosmology, indigenous practice, and indigenous knowledge and situate them in pre-existing Western categories, we not only do great violence to the, to the indigenous people and their knowledge, uh, in ignoring it and transforming it and extracting it, but we also fundamentally miss the opportunity of the radical potential that, that, that exists in understanding other ways of being in the world. But it's this violence of reducing into pre-existing categories and to extracting that I find particularly problematic with the rise of psychedelic medicine. The uh, picture on the right is a screenshot from MAPS, a Multidisciplinary Association of Psychedelics Science, which uh, uh, is an organization founded uh, to change social perceptions, to normalize and legitimize uh, psychedelic uh, science in the United States, but has spin-offs elsewhere. <clears throat> and they fund and have organized uh, their own research, and here they simply, this is their, their, their picture on ayahuasca. Ayahuasca, of course, is a, is a hallucinogenic brew used by indigenous groups throughout the Amazon region. It is, you know, after tobacco, possibly the most commonly used psychoactive substance in the Amazon region. Uh, and here, and it's fundamentally um, bound up. Uh, it, is, it is of central importance to notions of power, social organization, notions of production and reproduction, the entire uh, cosmological order, as Gerardo Rachel Domatov and Evan Schultes and many others have pointed out for, for a long time. But here we have its application in medical science, where it's now considered to be useful for the treatment of addiction, uh, of possibly other conditions, uh, depression and other things. And it's simply uh, uh, considered to be a, a formula that exists in a drug class, which is even incorrect. Uh, by any sort of notion here. I mean, psychedelics isn't really a drug class, although I do like the term, but tryptamine, there is no tryptamines in Banisteriopsis copy, and many indigenous people would make better, better ayahuasca brews with only copy, uh, which has no tryptamines. Nonetheless, uh, tryptamines are important in a Western uh, 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 scientific and imaginary, and therefore it has certain cachet. So let's put it in the page. Onset of action and peak, whatever that means. On the left is a picture of Jose Luis Diaz, a shaman I worked with for many years uh, in his garden plot, uh, which is very much part of a daily life uh, 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 system and, um, and embedded in all sorts of um, social practice. But I want to move on. So this abstraction uh, that, that has happened rapidly, and we could spend you know, a great deal of time on this, is part of a huge, um, really, cultural transformation whereby science has been used to transform uh, social norms and cultural values in the United States, firstly, but in other places as well, to make psychedelics legitimate tools for scientific research. But this, this cultural transformation has been driven by MAPS. There you go, psychedelic research for mass mental health. Mass mental health, right? <laughs> well, we're going to marketize it too. So, uh, and, and it's been by the use of strategic um, elite research uh, facilities, such as John Hopkins University, uh, which has you know, a huge program in psychedelic science and consciousness. Although if you look at the program itself, I fail to see what uh, the consciousness research is actually happening there beyond quantifying uh, certain brain activity, which you see expressed in, in Imperial College London over here, another leading uh, source of psychedelic medicine. But tied to this, and these abstractions, uh, these, these, sorry, these research programs uh, aim to uh, um, use chemical compounds um, in controlled clinical settings by applying quantifiable uh, uh, materialist uh, uh, um, scientific methods uh, to, to, to assess their potential as treatments for depression, addiction, Alzheimer's, uh, PTSD and a series of other uh, conditions. In all cases, the compounds, whether it's ayahuasca or other ex-plant compounds, including psilocybin, are completely extracted from any sense of their in initial uh, indigenous 
uh, uh, use or context or notions of mind or health and are, are simply retrofitted to existing disease categories. Uh, and, and that is sold as a social good as is. But this is associated with a, a drastic expansion in the marketization of psychedelic medicine. So we have from mind expansion to market expansion, and especially over the last five years, where you notice that this proliferation of venture, venture capital organizations uh, out competing each other, bragging about the amount of, of, of millions and millions of dollars, in fact, billions of dollars that have been generated to support new psychedelic medical research, which is all aimed to produce a product which can be mass marketed. <clears throat> the product is an extraction um, of, in most cases, uh, uh, from plant originally. So you see these sort of things investing in future healthcare disruptors, there's a whole series of them. There's you know, the psychedelic industry of the year in review, and you can track lifetime um, value and, 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 and quantities of money raised. This has raised, you know, some some questions by by commentators and participants in this in in this research, questioning the ethics of the corporate format that psychedelic medicine is taking. Psychedelic science has as uh, is adapting, but I would say that the, even in these cases, the questions of ethics don't extend to politics. They don't extend to questions of justice and the cosmopolitics, questions that challenge the very assumptions on which the research is based. They still accord to pre-existing Western categories, which give no place whatsoever for any intercultural dialogue, uh, which give any space or recognition for indigenous knowledge at any level, or recognize the the or, or even pay any attention uh, to the to the uh, radically um, interesting <laughs> and creative ways that indigenous people have made use of these substances. So the question of ethics, I think, um, actually becomes a mechanism to uh, to depoliticize, as of course many scholars of liberalism have pointed out, ethics uh, uh, distracts us from the politics. I conclude with four propositions, uh, which I hope um, you know might generate some discussion. One, the mainstreaming of psychedelic science has coincided with a relative closure of interest in intercultural dialogue around forms of knowledge, relations, and communication associated with these substances. And summarize this in a sense, it's about us now, and it's now acceptable to science and readily capitalized. Tradition just isn't scientific. Two, the radical possibilities of Amazonian politics and philosophy are inextricably tied to chemically diverse and culturally significant plants. However, the rise of psychedelic medicine fetishizes abstractions of compounds of individualistic disease categories and of market metrics that negate indigenous notions of knowing, being, and political agency. Three, the psychedelic industry is a form of extractivism that uses the symbolic capital of elite medical research facilities and vague nods to indigenous spirituality to conceal murky private interests. Because of this, we should expect to see more iterations of the QAnon shaman, the guy that wore the horns uh, on, the, on, the, on the attack of the White House a year ago was an ayahuasca and mushroom enthusiast. And there are all sorts of connections between political extremists, um, especially on the, on the right side of the spectrum, and um, new uh, psychedelic consciousness studies or weird interpretations of psychedelics. For the notion of plants as teachers is now interpreted by many in ways fundamentally compatible with biomedicine's abstraction of chemicals from community. And in this way can further disappear indigenous people's politics and philosophies from discussion of Amazonian plants. I, I didn't get a chance to speak to this, but one um, Western interpretation of, of the popularization of psychedelics um, has it that the plants themselves provide healing and, and one puts themselves directly into communication with plant substance. Uh, which has its own evolutionary history and, and, and which is a sort of uh, planetary slash cosmic history. But I would put it to you that this fits fundamentally with Western abstractions of, of chemical compound and the material aspects of plants as, as their healing, as opposed to um, indigenous notions of spirit and power that continually to be ignored. Uh, thanks. And... Uh, I look forward to seeing you all on the recording. Bye.
That was excellent and seamless, in fact. Um, and so now may we listen to Mireya Campanera. Now and now, <laughs> yes, perfect. Well, um, I I made the, this title "Medicinal Plants and Wyvern Populations from Peruvian Amazon" because I will speak about um, medicinal plants. This well, well, what you can see here is a picture from uh, one of the communities I have been spending more most of the time. Okay, and it's called San Jacinto. It's river into the Marañón River in Peruvian Amazon. Okay, and you see in the map the ubication because this community is next to the National Park um, Pacaya San Miriam. Okay, it's it, it's low basin called because it's no highlands. It's low basin of Marañón River. But here it's for explain my 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 work. well you explain it better maybe but my contact with peru and with my contact with um, amazon plants in fact um, my first um, trip was in 2014 in in ecuador uh, well as christopher um, talked about ecuador and i've been in the, that zone but i start as an anthropologist my first contact was in 2008 when I was working in in a project of, from um, Spanish cooperation agency, and it was a project that it called it was called Araucaria 21 Nauta, and the project it, um, it, it was about relationships of some communities of river in Marañón River um, with um, nature and uh, with environment. So I had to make. Um, uh, a research about that. So, and you see that this is the the first book they, that this project um, published, and it's a an, an visual guide about plants and animals. So, I here in, in this interesting because this guide um, have the the plants guide. They explain the the scientific name, but also. Um, it's a, a biologic description, but they also um, talk about uses, and so a lot of them are, had medicinal uses, and this is my first contact with medicinal plant. And the last um, one, well, these are, are the, my trajectory, and all of these um, publications, um, they talk about medicinal plants. Maybe the medicinal plants are not in the core of the, of the topic, but um, they, they speak about that. And the last one is that um, you see in 2022 book that it was published last week in, in Peru, in, in Lima. And they, they talk about this pandemic. And, and well, you see the, the topic is she, it's the medis, enfermedades que llegan de lejos. It's about diseases that come from outside. And they, it was a lot of researchers, um, Amazon researchers talking about um, um, how indigenous people and, and mestizo ones um, lived and experienced this pandemic. And I have a chapter on that. So, well, um, um, some ideas, um, Christopher and, and Robbins, I, I agree with most of them. And maybe I, I will talk about something that you have heard some minutes ago. So, well, the idea is that. Um, my first contact with Amazonian plants, um, I had described um, the, the activities, the, the uses of plants. So in horticulture, they had some gardens and they, they, the way they did medicinal plant protection. So in their understanding that in a, their medicinal systems. Well, the idea is that um, Mm, it's not just, as, as Robin said, it's just not a use, and we have to take always into account cosmovision. So um, when I talk with people about 
the gardens, they talk about secrets and they talk about dreams, not just about uses, healing with plants or feeding the family. So the idea is that, um, sorry, in this, in this box, no, I say Chapingo is the owner of the forest. So, um, well, Chapingo, that is uh, a master of the forest and he is the owner of the forest. So when people go to the forest to, to take medicinal plants, they have to ask permission to this um, being. So that, that's a quite important question. The other is that Chapingo is the owner of the forest, but plants has a mother or have a mother. Um, most of them medicinal plants. They, they, they make a difference within medicinal plants and other plants. But some people say that every, every plant has a mother, but everything has a mother. Maybe a pencil has a mother also. So the, the idea here is that they, they have, there is a negotiation between people and plants. And it's from an anthropological point of view, it's this asking and giving and receiving. And we, we, we have to talk about most, most of them, because we have this idea of giving and receiving. But we, as, as my colleague said, we talk about the Escola, Viveros de Castro, and Marisol de la Cadena, other authors that have been mm, talking and researching about this ontology. So I think that this, this process of asking and giving is, uh, in a way, it's a recognizing of authority of the mother. And because they ask, mother, please help me heal my son. And give And when they ask, to the mother that she helps people to, to... Can you hear me? Yes, absolutely. Ah, okay, it's so silent that I'm afraid <laughs> I'm alone. Oh, no, you're okay, great. so great. perfect. So when they ask, they they sometimes they give a present to the mother or maybe they shall go because they want to, um, to seduce that, that being for um, being re receiving the plant that may may heal heal them. So um, when this mother or this chapingo um, accepts this um, this person in, in their territory or or, or taking the, the the son that is a plant, it, it's the, the important idea that Viveiros de Castro um, put a, um, quite attention on that that this. this is a, relation, a social relationship, and this powerful being accept this relationship. Okay. Okay. Here I have a quotation about this process because in 2011 I participate in an, an inventory of, of medicinal trees, and this is the book that that I well I will share on the on the screen and this is a quotation of this book because we made a process with the faculties araucaria 21 nauta made a presentation uh, i made an inventory of forest um, um, of, of um, um, medicinal trees and um, some of the people from the community explains us the, the, their experiences and, and how they use the plants and here we can see the idea that um, um, the, 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 the idea of ways of channels for accessing the knowledge. You see that here uh, uh, it's, uh, um, they are explaining of a dream that the, a boy who was ill had, and in that dream, uh, uh, um, como se a soul appeared in a, a soul in a in a parent or in a body of a of a boy appear and, and explain oh hey you you are you have hepatitis and I have uh, um, um, a remedy for you and you have to do, do this this and this so the the boy wake up and explain that to their, their parents their parents go and search that plant and do did what the this dream was what was revealed in that dream and the and the, the the boy was healed, and we can see the picture of the boy. Well, now it's forty years old, so it was okay. 
And that's an example for the idea of understanding the, the forest and, and the plants in a, in a wider dimension. Well, I will, I want to start. And these um, many years of, of research, um, and while well, these ideas on, on that screen are um, written in, in a paper called La Humanidad Territorializada, Territorialized Humanity, because I speak about caring about medicinal plants, about relationships, about territory. And here are the ideas I, I wanted to, to express in that work. Um, because I think that a long ethnographical research um, is it, useful for that. And the idea is that social relationships between humans and non-humans developed in the act of caring, because they say, um, I care for this plant, I care for the forest, I care for my garden, I care for my family. So these mothers, the mothers, take care of their plant, their, their medicinal plants, and these plants are their source. The chapin is the master of all the forest animals. And uh, well, I didn't speak about that, but um, it's important that they, each lake, they say, has a boa, that is the big snake who cares for it. So the idea is that caring means to nurture and protect. And this caring is a continuous but not permanent activity that takes place in the limited area, forest, lake, or land. Because you can, there can be hostility and aggression and so expressed. Like a mother can injure a person that is not accepted. On, or maybe Shapingo can, can injure a person that he doesn't accept in their forest. So this ontologically, the being that cares is known as a subject and therefore with a human condition, as, as Robin said, no? that this is the Ribeiro's the Castro idea. As a result, and I will finish here, uh, we have to understand relationships of care between humans and non-humans, and we can talk about animal plants and others, and create and different Kukama Kukamiya territory leading us to talk about territorialized humanity. Um, this is one of the ideas I want to share with you today because we are so, um, it's difficult to understand we have to talk, we talk about medicinal lands, but this idea of rela social relationships within mothers of the plants and people um, is um, they are constructing um, relations of care and constructing as well um, the territory of these people and plants. Well, and I have more ideas, but we can share it later. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, and so we look forward to hearing a little bit more about the other things that you had your other slides look fascinating. We want to hear more about that. So we can do that in the conversation a little bit. Um, so Ruth, um, could you take it away? Yes. Uh, I want to ask if Eli, I just updated um, my slides because I realized the math would be super important. So it's not entirely necessary to have the time, but it is automatically updated where I still something else. Um, while the while the slide's coming up, I just want to say thank you so much to Christine um, for inviting me to participate and Eli for um, continuously helping with um, all of the logistics here, including my, my last minute edition of the map here. <laughs> I'll go with whichever one comes up. There we go. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, so this, this scripted image um, was taken in 2006 in the Peruvian Amazon, um, actually quite close to where Miriam works. Um, and I was uh, at that point working uh, with uh, the late and wonderful uh, Jim Duke, uh, Dr. James A. Duke, uh, who was trained as an economic botanist, um, but I knew him best as uh, my ethnobotanist mentor. So, there's supposed to be a likeness between the snake and the stalk of this um, 
the Hotia Pugas here. Um, perhaps not as similar as, as folks would have wanted it, but the illustration was supposed to reveal the doctrine of signatures. So this idea that how the plant looks or appears, whether it's the design on its um, roots or stems, or in which it grows, or the character in which it grows, um, fast and strong, um, or the shape of the leaves, that that somehow indicates the similarities between um, plant and animal, human or, or non-human bodies, um, that that then also indicates the way in which that plant would be used. So the, the sexy snake plant, um, I'll call it, or folks would also refer to this as ombron, like big man, uh, or no really little big man, um, because it was uh, known for helping with um, erectile dysfunction. So the main focus of my research examines indigenous intellectual property rights with regards to medicinal plants and the linked claims for political rights and territory. Uh, but there's some other areas of uh, botanical research that are also interesting to me. So today is gonna to be sort of some flashpoints of different areas and I'm curious to see um, where the intersections are, although it seems pretty clear that we're all very interested in politics and ethics around indigenous intellectual property rights, the disappearance of people and their knowledge, uh, where it should be a wonderful thing that a plant is a teacher, um, but in the ways that then that erases the human, uh, the ethics of that I think are absolutely questionable. Um, so one of the questions that I'm curious to ask as well for everyone today, um, and I'm curious if other people picked up on this, is sort of this seems to be kind of an upsurge of interest um, in medicinal plants. A slew of recent books um, that feature some form of plant hunting or plant hunter. Um, and I will just, I guess the spoiler alert is I'll tell you first how I feel about it. <laughs> so I'm curious if anyone else um, feels the same way that I really appreciate the ethnobotanical work, um, but I, I take issue with the plant hunter um, aspect of it. I think it resonates for me a bit too strongly with uh, kind of colonial plant uh, hunting past that also was unfortunately tied to uh, hunting people, uh, so very much tied to enslavement. And thinking about just kind of how there's a certain patriarchal predatory ring to being a plant hunter. Why, why not say a plant collector or better yet, a plant collaborator uh, or coexister? Um, next slide. So um, I thought I should add this little slide in terms of where I work. Um, so this triple frontier region of uh, Madre de Dios, Acre, and Pando. Uh, Madre de Dios is in Brazil. Excuse me, Madre de Dios is in Peru. Acre is in Brazil, and Pando is in Bolivia. And so it has this convenient acronym of MAP. Next slide, please. Even though it seems to be off the map. I think in converting to um, maybe Google PowerPoints, some of the text got lost here. I won't go through um, word by word, but I'll sort of let folks read it as I um, talk about the sexy plants. This is in a more profound this year. Um, I don't know, maybe we should have waited to have this kind of racy plant porno for a happy hour, but um, we just have sparkling water here. So those of you at home, um, this uh, quote, uh, is both uh, in Julien Nofre de la Métis, uh book, Plantes, where he talks about these similarities between uh, plants and humans. And Christine uh, mentioned uh, Erasmus Darwin. No, it wasn't Charles Darwin. Um, Charles Darwin thinking about the way that roots or the radicals um, have a kind of brain like activity. Um, but Erasmus Darwin is also pretty in love with plants as well, um, Charles Darwin's grandfather. So all to say, I mean, I would be remiss as a gender women's studies uh, professor to not talk about gender and sexuality um, as it relates to plants. Um, so I'm sure doing my job here. Um, but also, we don't want to point out some of these hyper cisgender um, botanical descriptions that we see. And I'm really curious about these back and forth conversations uh, about plants and human sexuality, um, particularly when, the next slide, there are these shocking headlines um, that come across, at least for plant scientists and those who love to read Scientific American. Um, I'm, I'm always thrilled to see these kinds of things come up, and I'm also really baffled um, about, or I guess bemused, bemused that um, 
this this is kind of the sexual fluidity of plants is um, so striking, um, not just the plant scientists, but the total wider public. And I think it's really the limited human lens here that I, I want to underline in terms of how plants are seen as shockingly um, changing sex or undergoing sex change, um, like the 14 volume or the striped peoples. Next slide, please. So I love this Libigena dentata plant, um, but other people call it the Venus flytrap. Uh, it is actually native to North Carolina and, and quite endangered. Um, I would, I guess, the, call those folks who go after um, the Venus flytrap actual plant hunters. So again, just thinking about some of the ways that um, Carla, uh, Carla von Linne or Linnaeus, um, widely referred to as the um, the father of modern taxonomy, how he created botanical classifications comparing plant bodies to human bodies. And while these are not categories that continue to this day, I'm just continue to be taken with spurious polygamy, equal polygamy, superfluous polygamy, and necessary polygamy. And I feel like that would add some more options um, to the polyamory crowd, at least. Uh, next slide, please. So thinking about Linnaeus's categories and how many of them haven't endured, um, reading the passages about polyandry that um, are highlighted at the end of um, this quote here, or excuse me, at the end of this PowerPoint slide, uh, Linnaeus was thinking a lot about poly polyandry in his work, uh, reading the then naturalists or anthropologists as they were at the time, um, and thinking about, again, this current fascination with the striped maple and the Portugal U that this continued interest in plant sexuality um, has a long lineage. Next slide, please. All right, so I'm really grateful to having had a little primer on ayahuasca. Um, this is certainly um, a common brew in its many different forms. Um, as Robin Rod referred to, there's just a lot of different ways that people drink the ayahuasca brew. And I am really taken with Amelia Sanabria's work. Uh, she asks in a talk, Healing Encounters, Ayahuasca and the Politics of Knowledge, directly addressing the psychedelic science community. Um, what is a plant? And I love this seemingly simple question, but her point very much is that plants are kin. Um, in the many ways that Christie's are listed, the different ways that plants um, and, the, and the investigations into them um, go beyond this idea of just the background or what is underfoot. Um, the plants really represent um, relations, not relations, not just relations in the environment, but um, underscore deep connections, um, colleges of war and um, And I am also interested in the ways that humans modify or certain humans modify, particularly ayahuasca, um, but I'm also curious about maca and coca as well different kinds of sacred plants um, in the Andes to the Amazon. And so I'm really curious, um, I hope we can have a conversation around this because I think what comes up for me in the research and happened very early on was, I was very curious to learn about a host of different medicinal plants, how they related primarily to reproductive health as contraceptives or even abortives. Uh, it was a lot easier to talk about natural Viagras. Um, people are, are just, that's a less taboo topic. Um, but it also became really clear that there was a kind of ethics of refusal in terms of uh, the ways in which people did not want to share information about the plants or their kin. And so that's a big part of my research methodology and, and thinking in terms of, um, as an ethnobotanist, what the politics are of refusal there or not printing or not sharing the knowledge that people share with me. Um, because it does not seem like that would be appropriate, that it would be disrespectful. Um, but then for ayahuasca, which is super well known at this point, um, in Acre, Rio Branco area, that, um, that borderline area of Brazil, there are many different indigenous groups before Bolsonaro came into power who were reclaiming ethnic identity through the body of the plant and through the practice of ayahuasca. So a kind of remembering um, so the, the Kundanawa, the Kashinawa, the Jaminawa all started drinking with Ashininka um, brothers and sisters and started to remember a past. So this is an area that was really hard hit by the first and the second rubber boom. And so 
many escaped enslaved Native peoples um, are often called isolated tribes. So people who have become into contact um, with the Western world are now remembering through um, the drinking of the plant. And there are some really interesting Brazilian um, anthropologists writing about this, Mariana Pantoja is one of them on the Kutunawa, um, Mauro Almeida and um, uh, Ma Manuela Carnero da Cunha, both of whom were at the uh, University of Chicago in anthropology for a while, thinking about the politics of cultural claims. Um, and then also uh, Marcos Almeida are all thinking about these questions and, and the, the questions about traditionality. How do you, how do you not take away these claims that are also then linked to political sovereignty and territory? But this anthropological argument that like, well, there's no such thing about us culture or it's not founded, it's always evolving. So how can you claim this kind of origin story for people linked to this plan? Um, and I think that's also an ethical realm for consideration um, for anthropologists. Next slide. So then switching over to thinking through some of the pharmaceutical ethics. Um, this was a 2008 move by the Swiss Federal Ethics Committee on Non-Human Biotechnology to establish a kind of IRB board for doing research on plants. Um, so what it means to not violate the moral integrity of plants is definitely a sliding scale. You have to prove your point. Um, but the examples that are in this booklet are things like the, the, the tops off of plants or just the way in which um, I myself am guilty of as a kid of flicking the head of a dandelion off its body. Um, that would absolutely be uh, a violation. Next slide, please. And then just because they're always welcome, any chance to talk about the film, uh, The Secret Life of Plants, because I love the soundtrack to it. Um, it's a gem, it's part of it. But this is, I think, where the precursor to Michael Pollan's intelligent plant um, came from. So thinking along the lines of plant intelligence, what that means or what intelligence means without the brain um, or plant sentience as well. Next slide. And then I'm also really curious when thinking about the ethics if plants are kin um, and thinking about the moral integrity of plants. These more recent moves, uh, Metacaco is one of the pharmaceutical companies based in Canada that's um, doing some of this research. They have submitted a patent um, for uh, actually a COVID vaccine developed through um, using antibodies in plants and trying to use plants as test subjects. So there's a potential as well to move pharmaceutical testing or perhaps cosmetic testing as well away from animal subjects to plants, which I think is really compelling, um, but I don't know how to square that with then this cosmological ethnobotanical sensibility where I'm really on board with plants as kin. Uh, primarily tobacco plants. I don't know if you want to be speciesist about it, but uh, that's primarily what's used in these, uh, this kind of research. Um, and then lastly, the next slide, um, I'm also very curious about the Barcode of Life project, which some of you might be familiar with. Um, we can actually go to the next slide too. My last, last one I know. Um, so these kinds of efforts, this is an older flyer, um, but one of the main reasons for having a, a database of all genetic um, barcodes in terms of identifying codes for, for non-human life, um, in theory, is to chart biodiversity, possible decline, but then also kind of be a warehouse in the way that Svalbard is um, for, for as a seed vault. But this would be a genetic vault. Um, so of course, the, the ways in which we might question access to this, uh, the ways in which, you know, in terms of ethnobotany and biopiracy, where is this genetic data coming from? How is it being used? Ostensibly, pharmaceutical companies would have far easier access to this than, say, indigenous peoples in the Amazon without internet. Um, so it becomes very hard to track that data as well for them. Uh, so I'm going to stop here. And my last slide is just a ginger plant of sorts. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm really excited to have conversations around and you're all the topics. Thank you all so much. Thank you.
just a few minutes, but I do want to like see if there are comments or questions in the chat that um, I know some people had to leave early. Um, but just to hear what it is that uh, the conversation generated. Um, and then to open the floor to questions or comments that people, um, including the people who presented, might want to, might want to make. I think I, I have a question that I would pose to the um, to the the presenters who are here. So Mireya, Mireya, uh, Chris, and Ruth. And I'm I'm just wondering if you can say a little bit more about the experience of you doing your ethnographic research on these plants, and perhaps say one thing that felt like a tension or one thing that was a, a decision that you had to make on the, as you were doing your research that, that um, sort of gives us a sense about what the stakes are of ethnographic research. Why, why, why the ethnographic research mattered or that methodology mattered, but also what made it challenging or um, you know some, something that you learned in that process um, I can start maybe Christine Great. Um, so I mean this kind of connects to a, a theme that I'm seeing emerging from our work and uh, things that I've been thinking about is um, this continuum of commodification, like between a singular, singular versus a, a, a commodity form. And um, also, uh, you know, in the Planian sense of, of embeddedness um, and context, like it seems like these are some of the the ideas that are coming out of, of various of our works is is the the degree to which which the lively um, embedded contextual notions of uh, or dimensions of of people's relationships with plants can travel or extend into other contexts um, and so I think one of the I guess ethical decisions that I made was um, to try to center the perspectives of the uh, Quechua people that I was working with. And um, I didn't in my work uh, do extensive long interviews with um, the founders of Runa or others. So, you know, I, I know these folks, I've talked to them um, Tyler Gage, who was one of the co-founders, wrote a, a whole book that's about like how Amazonian shamanism informs his business practices. Um, and I sort of intentionally didn't engage with some of his narrative. So it's like a, a form of, <laughs> of that refusal um, that you were talking about, Ruth, per perhaps is like, as much as you know who you are listening to or who you are, um, whose narratives you are emphasizing, it's it's also a little bit of a question of like how much her voice or emphasis are you giving to um, more dominant voices or interpretations. That's just maybe one place to start. Can I? Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Thank you. Well, maybe I think that the a long um, contact or research field work is important for me. Um, the first um, research stay it was about nine months, and I see now and I think okay, I didn't understand anything. 
because um, some of the core of the topics um, have been revealed for me um, years after. Um, I had relationship with this field work, with these people, and with just one community, most of them. But this relationship with the same community people helps me to understand um, uh, quite important dimensions of this society. Because I was um, talking about plants, and I finished understanding the way of understanding and constructing territory. So if you focus just in a topic, it's difficult for you to understand the other one that is um, crossing, okay? And about challenge, and I remember a dialogue with an, um, a forest, ¿cómo se llama? Un forestal, un ingeniero forestal, a forest engineer, yeah? And he, he he helps me a lot because he has been working for the in the Amazon for a lot of years. And I remember a dialogue we had in a, in a ship coming back to the city and say, okay, if you dream, for example, seeing this dream that the, the soul of the plant appears in a dream and tells how you have to prepare the remedy for healing, okay. So we were talking about how is this communication functioning? The plants come to the person, the person is calling the plant. And I think, okay, I'm losing my scientific approach because I, I, I think that it was a quite interesting um, conversation. But then I take a bit of uh, distance and I see myself and say, okay, are you losing your scientific approach because you are talking about that with an engineer, what's happening here? That's an anecdote, but I think that it's quite interesting of the challenge of this kind of research. Do you wanna take up the question of why ethnography or how ethnography? Yeah, I think, I mean, some of the why and the how are linked in terms of, um, I dropped out of med school, <laughs> so I became a medical anthropologist, so I, some of my choices were perhaps more limited in terms of my scientific method. Um, I think what is so rich and exciting for me about ethnographic fieldwork and the kinds of ways that, the questions that we compose um, that, I think your your anecdote, Mary, I think is so interesting because the uh, sort of foundational parts of what I love from Marisol de la Carrera's work, which you also mentioned, um, is just dismantling entirely this the strong division between indigenous science and Western science and the ideas that um, I mean, this was something that I really appreciated. Um, learning in many ways from Jim Duke, who was my mentor, but I found it a little frustrating that indigenous knowledge always had to be justified and backed up by a laboratory and like, like quote, real science. And so there was, I mean, there was a lot of support and excitement, but it was like, oh, look, it's been proved. I was like, but there's also thousands of years of that proof already. So um, I think ethnography opens up those questions, I think, in rich ways to talk about you know, what counts as truth and who gets to be the expert. Um, and it also opened up ways to, I think if I'd been working for a pharmaceutical company, I couldn't have shifted gears in the ways that when like, I arrived to talk with people in NACI and was asking about like, well, what does this medicinal plant do or what do you use? And then realized that like, there was actually a really important local indigenous effort to inform communities about indigenous people, about uh, biopirates. Mm. And one of the things, like everyone assumed I was from Sao Paulo, and I came with a Paulista accent. So that, like I started asking these questions and they're like, oh gosh, she fits everything, right? Like I'm blonde. <laughs> I don't, you know, my, my Portuguese sounds like it's from the big city. And I'm asking all these questions about their plants. So I fit the, like the iconic description of a biopirate. Uh, which is not what I wanted to be. And so I ended up shifting gears to participate with this effort called Aldeas Vigilantes or Vigilant Villages. Um, so I really appreciate this question because I think there's a flexibility um, 
that is not an ethical flexibility, but it's one that allows us to adapt our method to an ethical um, foundation that I think should be part of like, the graphic integrity to begin with. Yeah, I think about what Mireya said about how long you have to actually spend to do research. Like you have to spend time with the community. And then like five years later, you actually understand what somebody told you like two months in or, or five years later, they finally tell you what's actually happening because they finally trust you. And I think that the fact that ethnography puts us on the same, we're actually, the, you know, people can tell us, cannot tell us information. The people who are local who know things, they can make decisions as well to not give us information, to not say things, or they want to know if we're trustworthy. You know, we're not automatically okay as researchers because we come in and we say we want to learn from you, right? I, I think the fact that people can be suspicious of us and push us away, I think is actually a really important part of the ethical engagement of ethnography that people can tell can not answer the question. I think it's so, so, so important about about our research method. And I think it's what makes this kind of research ethical, that people can say no, yeah. right? Um, one of the things that I was thinking about that came up a lot in our presentations, um, or in your presentations, and that has come up in some of the research I've done on, on this plant. So I'm, so I'm drinking Elex Vomitoria, and um, it's a it's a cousin of Wayusa. It's a cousin of Mate. Uh, so it grows all up here. The leaves are a lot smaller, but it has you know it has caffeine, theobromine, theophylline, etc. I mean, it's got the same kind of profile. Um, and it was traded for hundreds and hundreds of years in the southern part of North America. But it was given a scientific name that makes it sound like it causes. <laughs> like it causes vomiting. Um, and of course, ritualized regurgitation is part of usage of Wayusa and it's part of usage of yerba mate traditionally, although people don't do it now. Um, so that wasn't a problem for Wayusa or mate, but for, for this drink, it was. And part of it is it was given a name by a scientific authority in London to say that what it is, is something that causes you to vomit. And all of the indigenous knowledge and all of the non-indigenous knowledge of use of this plant. So people at the South who used it to the present, all of their knowledge about how the, the fact that it was not emetic was ignored compared to the scientific name. To the point that I gave a presentation at the Atlanta Botanical Gardens two weeks ago and their head botanist was like, really? <laughs> it's, but I, what part of it is not a met? I was like, well, I don't know about the berries, but you can eat them. You can drink the leaves. I've, I've given it to students at Duke, and I didn't ask for their permission. I just gave it to them <laughs> from the plant outside our window. So, so I think it's really interesting who, how much of authoritative scientific knowledge is wrong. Yeah. Yeah. It's not just it emphasizes a different priority. It's actually not correct <laughs> scientifically. And I think that that's, it's, and I think it's because the ethnographic data doesn't count as much as, right. as, as what somebody who is in a lab says that is totally wrong. <laughs> it's actually not true, which is why I'm drinking it here. So that you will know this is not emetic. <laughs> I'm totally fine. And um, so I just, maybe, you know, people can say one or two things about that if they want to, and then we can close this conversation because we have gone longer than we planned. But I think um, it just means that we can say a lot more. Yes. Um, that we need to do this more. Yes. Any, any reflections on the lies that, that get written into the scientific record? Um, this is not a, about the lies that get written into the scientific record, but it's, <clears throat> it's super interesting. You know, the um, Shuar and Achuar have a really robust um, tradition of using Wayusa as an emetic um, 
and some Quechua people have experimented with it too, but, um, you know, I just wanted to mention that, that, that's a yeah. really interesting, um, part of their practice that has a whole, it, it meant that people for a long time, uh, thought that Wayuso was just an emetic and not, uh, something that you could consume in reasonable quantities as a, a, a normal stimulant. But so I just want to say, I hear you on that, but yerba mate was also used ritualistically for regurgitation purposes. And yeah. by the 1550s, it was being commercialized in Paraguay. So the first written record of, of, of mate is not the natives drink this interesting thing, it's the Spaniards are selling this. <laughs> So right. I really wonder why one plant becomes commodity right away, whereas you know Wayusa has to push against it. And this oh Miguel, you have the answer. There's a question no, no, here. No, I, 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 I'm thinking that. I mean, if you want to think about why a plant is or is not or was was not recognized. I think we have to go back to the powerful plants that were, like tobacco, yeah. or sugar, or corn. Right? Those are plants that became commodities, or coffee coming from one of those. But, but uh, there's a bunch of, of plants that were captured, transformed, domesticated, uh, and, and, and got into global markets. So they were equal to, and they are foundational on, on, on capitalism, sugar, as a matter of fact, tobacco, right? or corn, still, yeah. right? Or, or, I don't know, wheat today, we are suffering for, for that, right? Then the issue is, do we want to go there and try to domesticate the knowledge of a specific plants that probably have a, a ecological uh, need to live in certain conditions that cannot be domesticated. You know, I'm thinking about uh, a place like Sibundoy in the, in the, you know, the, the uh, Amazon Andean uh, transition, right? The, the, the La Botica of, of indigenous peoples of the South, right? in which people still plant up to 150 different plants in their chakras. You cannot domesticate them and to put them in monocrop kinds of situations to extract that. But, and we know, right? And there's lots of research. There's what do we want to do with this, right? Or do we want to, like the tea version of, or the coffee version of that plant, right? Do we want that for them? And what that would do to them if we want it, if, if that happens, right? And uh, there is the ethical dimensions right there, right? And, and, the, and the ecological dimensions right, of that too. I think I'm, I've been drinking my sixth cup of coffee. <laughs> I, I'm speaking to a plant. I'm speaking to a plant, right? We do speak to plants. We do use them in many ways or forms. Of course, this is a global commodity, right? I don't know if this one comes from Sumatra, or from my country, Colombia, or from Guatemala, whatever. Right? But it is, it's a global commodity. Do we want that to be one for the benefit of who, what, where? Huh? That's, that's yeah. what we take away. Uh, just, just a question. Um, um, a question about that. I think that we can go back to the question that Ruth put into on the on the table. That is, what is a plan? And we say, if we say, what is a plant? Biomedicine answer: Oh, that's uh, something that uses to me for healing. So, and this idea, this utilitarian idea um, or perspective, and, and the, hier the hierarchy, no? the hierarchy that is between plants and people, the, is the, um, a, a challenge for us because it's quite. Um, heavy this um, inequality so we say okay um 
to say that an, a, a plant has authority and the plant decided to you to heal or not to heal or maybe damage you, that's a, a shocking idea. So um, there are some um, difficult and quite challenging for us to explain well, but um, you can access knowledge just by dreams. And we have to respect that and take into consideration because a lot of maybe uh, this has um, been able, o sea, ha funcionado, no? I don't know how to say that, but this authority of the knowledge, well, um, biomedicine or, or biology don't want to share their authority. So which knowledge is accepted? Just the one is powerful in in politics as nowadays, no? in, in politics, in 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 bold in words. Yeah. Um, so I think we have overrun our time, which makes me think, and we have just started our conversation. It just makes me think we need to do this in person again for a long time. And I want to thank the participants who said yes. You all are amazing. Um, and so to the public, I want you to know they have been so flexible and so understanding and so excited about this conversation. And so I just want to say thank you um, to the people who, to, to our presenters, so thank you. Um, and I want to thank the public that's part of this conversation. Um, and yes, uh, just ask for a way forward from the Franklin Humanities Institute to actually have a plant symposium here where we can bring you all yes. and you can taste these things, maybe not ayahuasca, <laughs> and we can actually have this conversation over a longer period of time. So thank you very, very much. Cheers, take care. Thank you, Christine and Noah and Chris and all of you. Ruth yeah. and all that's Gracias, Gracias. Gracias. Hasta luego.